I'd like to start by telling you a bit about the history of this project. Uh, MapShaper is a software tool that I started working on in grad school in, in Madison. My advisor was Mark Harrower, and we demoed a very early version of this program at NASIS in 2005. Um, so the first version of MapShaper was basically a, a special purpose tool. It could do one thing. It could simplify polygon shape files while maintaining uh, adjacent boundaries between neighboring polygons. So if you Google MapShaper, you'll see some references to that early program, including a paper that Mark and I wrote together. Uh, um, so this was about 10 years ago. I put a version of MapShaper online where it, it stayed basically untouched for about five years. Uh, today somebody reminded me that uh, to tell you that the, I've completely rewritten it. Uh, it used to be in Flash and, and C++. There was like a back end and a front end thing. I uh, rewrote it in JavaScript. There's no back end. There's no server. When you use it, it downloads it into the, into the browser, which is really good to know. Um, so uh, in addition to rewriting the thing in JavaScript, I made the, the source code I opened, uh, opened up the source code, I put it on GitHub, and I made a <laughs> thing. Uh, Nathaniel was one of the people who was pushing for that. <laughs> um, and I improved simpli the simplification feature in some really important ways, and then I also started adding more and more editing functionality, and I also added a command line interface. So this year seemed like a good time to reintroduce MapShaper to Nasus. It's been really useful to me and my colleagues at uh, the New York Times graphics desk, and I, and I hope that you find it useful as well in your work. So, um, I've made a few slides from maps from the New York Times where MapShaper was used in some aspect of the map making process, and on these slides at the bottom, I've indicated which MapShaper editor commands were used. Others were used as well. Here I'm just calling out a few of them to give you an idea of sort of the range of things that it can do. So uh, this, this first image here is a, a cartogram, a hex cartogram from the British parliamentary elections earlier this year. And uh, I used the, the lines command, which allowed me to classify the different boundary types and so you can see how I put a stroke, a different stroke around the region boundaries uh, within the UK and uh, a slightly stronger stroke around the outside of everything. And there's a join command, which as you might expect, it uh, associates data from an attribute, some kind of attribute table with the shapes. Okay, so uh, this, this beauty is by my colleague, Tim Wallace. It's a, flow map, I think it's showing refugee movements. And uh, for this he used MapShaper's points command, which has the ability to locate sort of the thickest part of each polygon, which is often a good place to use as an anchor for symbols or for labels. Uh, if you just were to use, say, the centroid, if uh, when polygons are ir irregular, as I'm sure most of you know, um, often that doesn't make a good anchor point. So here's an, another map that I'm sure many of you have seen, also by Tim. He used MapShaper's clip command to create these shapes, uh, showing which parts of the country uh, Trump won the popular vote. And there's a companion map for Clinton, kind of the inverse, as you'd expect. Exactly, exactly the inverse. Um, another Tim Wallace map. He uh, this. Uh, shows roads in Iraq and Syria. He used the simplify command just to, uh, it was uh, like very complicated with a lot of vertices, so he wasn't able to work with it effectively in Adobe Illustrator, so he simplified the lines so that Illustrator wouldn't come to a grinding halt. Um, here's a map by my colleague, Boy. Uh, he made a series of these maps sort of imagining where Amazon might locate its new uh, headquarters, 
uh, and so Mapshaper's filter command was useful in uh, sort of filtering a, a subset of a group of features based on attribute data. Um, so these are slides from an animation, and uh, <clears throat> this was all scripted. Um, so the script could generate a whole series of slides. Uh, so one of the newer, relatively newer features in MapShaper is the ability to apply projections, reproject, and it has uh, the Proj4 library built in. I ported that to JavaScript. That's the same projection engine that's in QGIS and a bunch of other open source software. And MapShaper also is used to uh, apply a color scheme. So that's, that's it for the slides uh, of, of work. Now I'd like to demo the actual interface for you. So for those of you with laptops, I've set up a, a URL here um, with the example data sets that I'm gonna show in this presentation. And uh, you can follow along if you like and just play around. So this slide shows the initial view of the web interface. It's basically the same as the regular interface but with the addition of a, a section here with those sample slides. So now I'm gonna switch over to, if I can do this, the, um, the live map shaper. Okay, so that's this. So I'm going to um, introduce MapShaper's web interface by demonstrating how to use it as a data viewer. The first group of sample files comes from the National Weather Service and shows the path of Hurricane Irma, which hit Florida last month. So here you can see a list of files that it's going to import. This is what you'd see if you drag some files onto the browser window. Uh, so there are four shape files here. Shape files are composed of individual files, and that's what you're seeing here, in addition to a CSV file. Um, so I'll input those. So I wanna just quickly show the uh, interface for interacting and inspecting these shapes. So I've clicked this I button here. Oh, that's pretty small here. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a web page, so I could zoom the browser here. That, that'll be easier to look at. Okay, so, uh, so as I hit on a shape, it shows the attributes there. Uh, it was really important for me to have a hover effect because uh, one of my pet peeves with GIS software is it's kind of clunky just to hit on a shape. You have to click the shape and it just takes a lot of time to inspect a layer. Here you can just sort of swipe along it. So here's a whoop, polygon file. The same thing, you just kind of mouse over it. Now, if I click it, I can pin it there and, uh, and then interact with it at a, some more. So for example, as I clicked it, all of these fields here became interactive. So I could, for example, uh, edit it here. That's kind of a dumb example, but it worked. <laughs> so, uh, and if there are multiple uh, overlapping shapes, I just wanted to show that you could, it'll hit on them all. If you wanna get at some of the ones that are kind of hidden behind the top one, this thing comes up and you can just tab through them. Okay. Uh, and finally, if it's just data records, I, I, I wanted to have the ability to hit on them and inspect them, so I just made these boxes here. The boxes aren't part of the file, it's just a way to interact with the, with the data layer. Um, okay. So before I go any farther, I wanna talk a little bit about the um, Oh, one more thing I wanted to demonstrate. I've zoomed the browser so this console came up really huge, but I don't think it matters here. If you want to get more detailed information about a layer, you open the console. The console is where most of the power of MapShaper lives. There's like a, a lot of commands that are available there. By typing info, it shows me all of the layers here in my data, in my collection of data sets, including 
the uh, attribute data and the first value, the value of the first record in each, which is extraordinarily handy. It gives you the proj4 string, which can be used for reprojecting and just to tell you what projection the data set is in. Okay. So I want to talk just a little bit about how to get help with these commands because there are a lot of them and they're not exactly self-explanatory. This console basically is a command line interface. You can type all the commands, MapShaper's commands here. So I typed help and you've got a list. You can see all of the commands and a brief summary of what each one does. Editing commands, IO commands, getting information. And then to get detailed information about how each one works, you just go uh, help, say, simplify, and it gives you the individual options for that. So that'll help make sense of what, I, what I'm gonna do next. Okay. So next I wanna talk about what to do about polygon data sets that contain gaps and overlaps between adjacent polygons. This is a common problem when you have real, uh, data sets that you've gotten from a number of sources. So here I've picked three data sets, each of which have some topology problems. Um, so here's, here's that original hex cartogram. It came from Esri UK. And you can see that it's identified a lot of intersections between these lines. We have to zoom in pretty far to see what's going on. So uh, this is a problem in case we want to work with the topology of this layer. Uh, when we have this situation, we can't actually identify like nice boundaries for regions. So there's a clean command. It's two weeks old. I'm previewing it here for the first time. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. Uh, but it might still have some bugs. So um, let me make this smaller. Um, so the clean command will remove all of these overlaps and um, like that. <clears throat> so if I zoom out again, you can see that like there's none of those, those like intersections that it had detected, and I can confirm that by dissolving all of these shapes into one big blobby shape, and I'll. I'll Add that to a new layer. That's what the plus symbol here does. And it seems like it didn't quite work <laughs> perfectly. And I think I know the reason. The reason, here's my layer of shapes, is um, because some of the offsets were outside of like the, the, the tolerance that it would snap to. So I'm going to rerun this. With, um, by inspecting with the mouse here, I can see these coordinates down here. And I previously determined that, in fact, the offsets are all within a unit of one. I don't know what units this has. It's a cartogram. It doesn't really have units. Um, so now I did that and it dissolved cleanly. So let's, let me just show a couple of these other here. Here's a really gnarly one. This is Electro Precincts from Montana. And if you zoom in, it looks like probably there was some hand digitization going on here. And um, so some of the, the, they don't really meet very well. Well, the clean command can help with that. There's a, um, another, uh, some of the gaps are quite large, so the default gap area that it will fill is, is uh, so small that it won't get all the gaps here. So I've previously determined that um, two square kilometers, this is in units of meters using scientific notation, will get all the gaps. So I've, uh, I've cleaned that up. And I think I'm probably taking a little more time than I should with this, so uh, I'm gonna move on.
Um, okay, so I don't really have time to get deep into the, the uh, command line interface, but let me just say that it's really my go-to way of using MapShaper. It's really easy to script the command line interface, um, and that's a big advantage when you have data sets that might change and you need to reapply a whole series of editing commands. I'm gonna show you what that looks like now. Uh, if I can do that. Okay, so the way I usually, in, um, whoops, use the command line interface is to create a make file, which basically is, just contains a series of shell commands. Um, so it's possible to create a, a, I guess you'd say a batch process or a series of editing commands just by stacking up these, these map shaper commands here to go from source data to a finished map. And so these commands take raw data, basically a, a data set from uh, David Leap who compiles election data and another one from the Census Bureau and uh, converts it into this, which is not a perfect map, it's not a finished map, but at least it kind of shows you the potential for transforming um, raw source data into a, a styled map. And I think I'll leave this as a homework assignment if you wanna go to this uh, URL here. You can kind of work through this uh, long series of commands with the help of the inline command line help that I showed you earlier. Uh, I hope that you'll be able to kind of figure out why it works the way it works. So at the very end of this long series of commands here, it, whoops just where it's covering up here. It's outputting an SVG file. Um, that's this. So that'll give you like maybe another sort of um, a way to start using and learning this tool. I'm gonna stop there and I don't know if I have time for questions but I'd really like to take your questions. We have time for two questions. Does anyone wanna ask Matthew anything? Yeah. Uh, What formats does it export in? Oh, okay. Um, it exports, uh, for like a styled map, it only exports SVG. That's a relatively, that's a relatively new uh, ability. Uh, it has a limited number of different vector data formats that it can work with. So you can do shapefile, you can do GeoJSON, you can do something called TopoJSON that many of you may not be familiar with, and you can do like a CSV file. Oh, yeah. Is there a new, a what? Undo. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> no, there's no undo command. And I don't intend to create an undo command because I actually have a reason for not implementing undo. I think uh, the workflow that, that I've developed that I like starts with source data, uh, with, with like source data and outputs, your output data. If you're doing undo, that kind of um, implies like a set of sort of interactions that would be hard to reproduce later. So, uh, I, I'm, and also to increase tremendously the complexity of the program, which is the main reason. <laughs> uh, is, is that all I have time for? Yep, thanks, Matthew. Okay, thanks everybody.